It is not easy to grow squash or pumpkins in Ireland, or it is fairly easy to grow the plants. But to get squash at the end of the season that are fairly mature and ripe enough so that they taste like they should, and that have developed tough enough skins so that they're able to store for long periods over the winter, that is not so easy. The main issue is our cool maritime climate, with not enough warmth in the summer to allow these plants to grow fast enough, with a fair amount of wind and frost at either end of the season to limit the length of time the plants have in the gardens. I have been growing one hybrid variety of squash called Crown Prince for quite a few years, and it generally produces a heavy crop of really delicious squash, at least with the fruit that has had a chance to ripen. But there are so many different types of squash and pumpkins out there with such diverse tastes, sizes, and possible uses in the kitchen, and I've wanted to find some other varieties to grow. So this past year, we finally put in the effort to grow a wide range of different squash and pumpkin varieties as the first big step of finding other varieties that will produce well in this context. I have wanted to do a proper variety trial for a while and have been collecting seeds for a wide range of different varieties, but it was only this season that I felt that we had the capacity and the space to grow so many of these large plants. We ended up growing one plant each of 27 different varieties, with about half of them in the space between two older polytunnels, and the other half in undeveloped ground in the black plot. In both cases, we spread a fair amount of concentrated fertility on the ground to hopefully provide these hungry plants with enough food to grow well, and used two sheets of ground cover fabric to cover the ground and any existing vegetation, and planted the squash and pumpkin transplants in the gap between the two sheets. The growing conditions and soil fertility in both locations could have been better, and I didn't set up adequate watering systems to be able to supply these plants with enough water to really thrive during the dry periods that we did have. But this offered the opportunity to see how these different varieties of squash and pumpkins would do in less than ideal conditions, which is often the case in so many gardens. And we had quite a good growing season with not too much water stress and a bit warmer weather than usual, despite the few cold periods earlier in the summer. And it was amazing to see such diversity in the colors, sizes, and shapes of the squash as they developed, often hidden among the vigorous vines and large leaves. And in the autumn, when the plants died back, the abundance of some varieties and the poor results of others became really apparent. The diverse range of squash plants that we grew, which included what many people would normally call pumpkins, are actually from three different species of plants. One of the more common ones, the cucurbita pepo, includes summer squash like courgettes and zucchini, and it also includes the acorn types of winter squash, of which we grew five different varieties as part of this trial. The table queen variety is a fairly typical type of acorn squash, and the one plant we grew produced a reasonable number of fruit, but only two of them seemed to ripen with a darker color and characteristic orange patch. And cutting one of the darker ones opened, the inside seemed reasonably ripe with mature seeds, but I doubt the rest of them will ripen anymore, and one of the squash has already rotten. Another hybrid acorn variety called Tuffy produced a lot more squash that were considerably smaller, about half the size the variety is supposed to produce, but they do seem to have ripened at least. Another two acorn type varieties called Harlequin and Festival are also both hybrids with really beautiful and decorative colors and both of them seem to have ripened well, though not a lot of squash was produced on either of these plants. The open pollinated sweet dumpling plant produced a few more smaller fruit that are partially acorn shaped but also were flatter on the bottom. And these squash also seem to be reasonably ripe with similar colored flesh inside and very decorative coloring outside. These types of squash are generally known to store for a long time if they can actually ripen, and their smaller size can make them more convenient for some uses in the kitchen. But none of them were very productive, at least not in the context of this trial, with the variety that produced the heaviest crop of squash also didn't ripen very well. Some of the more decorative varieties seem to have been faster growing with more mature squash, and I wonder if in different conditions and probably more fertile soil, they would have been much more productive. There are a range of other types of pepo squashes that we grew, and one, the delicata variety, we grew as part of a larger planting in the simple garden, rather than in this side-by-side -side trial. And these four plants produced a huge number of squash, with a significantly higher yield, most likely due in part to the better soil fertility in this garden. Unfortunately, the seeds that I had bought in for this variety had been cross-pollinated, and each of the four plants produced a significantly different type of squash, and I don't know if any of them are true to the variety type. 
but they definitely show the possible high yield of these types of squash plants. The spaghetti squash plant in the variety trial is also a pepo type and produce a reasonable yield, but a few of the squash failed to ripen and one of them has already rotted. We also grew a jack-o'-lantern variety, which was disappointing, producing only three small to moderate sized pumpkins for Halloween. The hybrid fairy variety produced a decent yield of fairly large squash with a bright orange flesh inside and the seeds seemed reasonably developed. But I'm not sure if they have been able to fully ripen as there is still a band of green and yellow under the skin, which I generally feel is a sign that they are not as ripe as they could be. The Rondini variety produced a lot of very small squash with really tough skin and they seem to be fairly ripe, but the overall yield from this one plant was quite low. I haven't done a proper taste test of these other Pepo types yet, but going by the yield and apparent ripeness, I think the Fairy F1 variety seems promising and I want to grow the Delicata variety again, but I'm not sure I'm interested in the other three, at least based on this one trial. Another 15 of the varieties that we grew this year came from the Cucurbita maxima species of plants, which I would divide into two general groups the smaller fruited Japanese types of squash, and the plants that produce significantly larger squash or pumpkins. We grew four very similar red skin Japanese squash, which were all fairly similar size and shape, with thinner flesh and a fairly large seed cavity inside. There were subtle differences between the Uchiki Kiri, the Solar, the Fichter, and the Orange Hokkaido varieties, but I'm not familiar with them enough to be able to tell one from the other. The two green curry and green Hokkaido varieties had a darker green skin, but the inside were fairly similar to the orange varieties. In one small taste test that we did, the six squash were all very tasty with fairly subtle differences. And I wonder how much of these differences might be due to how ripe the different squash that we sampled were. There are also two gray skin varieties that I would include in this group. And the blue ballet plant only produced one small squash, which was the lowest yield of the whole trial. The blue curry variety grew more, but the one that we cut open didn't seem as ripe as the other squash in this set with a characteristic green band just under the skin. The weight of each of the squash produced by these Japanese types was between half a kilo and two kilograms, which makes them quite useful in the kitchen where a whole squash can be used at one time. Another dark skinned hybrid variety we grew was called Kobacha, which seemed to produce similar types of squash, though a bit bigger, with some of them between two and three kilograms, though unfortunately they didn't seem fully ripe. The total weight of squash produced by each of these nine plants was in the same low range as the acorn types, with the orange Hokkaido better than the rest. But I would want to get a lot more out of these types of squash plants in future trials before selecting any of them to really rely on, especially considering how much space these types of plants can take up. With the other set of Maxima varieties, the squash or pumpkins were quite a bit bigger, generally between 3 and 8 kilograms, with one variety producing even bigger pumpkins. The Crown Prince hybrid variety, which I've grown in the gardens for quite a few years, produced 7 squash on the one plant in this trial, with an average weight of about 4 kilograms. This is a big yield from one plant of a variety that I've come to rely on, with a light grey skin and a thick orange flesh inside that I really like the taste of. But these squash don't always ripen, including the one from this plant that I cut open, with the lighter orange changing to a green underneath the skin. I have found that if the color of the flesh is deeper and this green band is thinner, the squash tastes more flavorful and creamier, and they also seem to store for longer, so it is a key thing that I look out for with this type of squash. And I think it's probably the same with a lot of other squash varieties. The variety called Hungarian Blue produced one squash that was already starting to rot, another that was obviously immature, and it looks like the other two squash would have needed quite a bit more time or heat to ripen. The Turks Turban squash also seemed to be quite unripe, with pale flesh and soft seeds, and the Mariana de Chiogia variety seemed to be a bit more ripe, with dark flesh, but the green band was still reasonably pronounced, and both of them produced considerably less than the Crown Prince variety. But the Rouge Vif des Temps squash seemed to be the most mature out of this set of larger squash or pumpkin varieties, at least based on the one squash that I cut open. The color of the flesh was quite dark and consistent, especially just under the skin, and the seeds seemed to be fully developed. But it is hard to tell, as I don't really know what any of these squash would look like if they've had the time and heat to become fully mature. 
The largest squash or pumpkin of the whole trial came from a plant called Jelle Centenar, which grew one pumpkin that weighed over 15 kilograms and another over 23 kilograms, which is the biggest variety that I've ever grown. Cutting a chunk out of one of the pumpkins revealed a fairly thick orange flesh that seemed ripe and seeds with a hard shell, but I'm not sure what to do with such a large pumpkin and I wonder how long it would store. But it was by far the biggest weight of harvest from any of the plants in this trial, followed by my standard Crown Prince variety, and of the other four varieties, it seems a Rouge Vif de Tempe shows the most promise. The third type of squash or pumpkins that we grew were from the Cucurbita moschata species of plants, which seems to have a lot fewer varieties available. The most common type from this species is probably the butternut squash, of which we grew two different varieties. The fairly common butternut waltham variety produced only five relatively small squash, which still had a green tint to the skin and did not seem ripe at all. And the hybrid hunter variety had even smaller number and size of squash, which were perhaps a little bit more ripe. These are both really disappointing for such a popular type of squash, especially with the more expensive hybrid seeds for the hunter variety that was apparently bred for growing in more temperate climates of this part of the world. The Futsu Black is quite a different squash compared to the butternut types, and this variety was also quite low yielding with five interesting looking squash. But the Muscade de Provence was quite remarkable, with three large pumpkins that had a really thick, intense orange flesh inside, but apparently the skin is supposed to turn from dark green to ochre or yellowish brown when ripe. So despite the significant yield with one pumpkin weighing almost 12 kilograms, it seems this variety will need a fair amount more warmth in the growing season to properly mature. The purpose of this trial was to start to find varieties of squash and pumpkins that will provide different sizes, shapes, and tastes to complement the main variety that we already grow. And more importantly, they need to be able to produce a reasonable crop of fully mature squash in the relatively cool seasons that we have here in Ireland. It was really interesting to see that the Crown Prince hybrid variety that I selected quite a few years ago produced the highest yield out of all of the plants in this trial, apart from the giant Jelle Centenar. I am still interested in trying the Delicata variety, assuming I can get different seeds that are not been cross-pollinated. It would be nice if I could get one of the acorn types to produce a greater number of squash. And I also really like the size and taste of most of the Japanese types. And I wonder if they would naturally be less vigorous and would benefit from much better soil fertility. And the Fairy F1 hybrid seems like it could be quite a good medium-sized squash, though I don't know if it offers anything significantly different than the Crown Prince variety that we already grow. I think the large Rouge Vif de Tempe and the Muscade de Provence varieties are really interesting and definitely worth trying to grow again with hopefully better conditions. I'm not sure about the rest of them, as in different conditions they might produce a lot better. And I'm interested in growing a lot of them, plus perhaps a few more, in one of the polytunnels next year. I will be keeping quite a few of the squash that we grew this year to see how long they might store. And the taste is also another key factor, and how the different types can be used in the kitchen, which we've only just begun to explore. And with so many of these squash and pumpkins not seeming to mature properly, I'm unlikely to really know what they're supposed to taste like. But in the end, if a variety can produce a reasonable crop of ripe and tasty squash or pumpkins in this climate, ideally which will store well, then it's not really worth growing, even if it might produce an excellent squash crop in some other context.